So let's talk a little more about motivation and how we drive motivation in organizations. How do we motivate employees? Many companies offer a diverse array of a diverse array of benefits that are designed to improve the quality of employees' lives and increase their morale and satisfaction. Some of the best companies to work for um, offer on-site daycare, uh, concierge services to help people with dry cleaning, shoe repair, and things, running errands, if you will, domestic partnership benefits for same-sex couples, fully paid sabbaticals, tables on their uh, slide offers. Uh, tables on this slide show some other suggestions which you can use. For example, interact with employees in a friendly, open manner. Create an environment of openness, friendliness, and trust. Equitably dispense rewards and other sorts of incentives. Create a culture where collaboration is the norm. Provide both positive and constructive negative feedback, constructive criticism about how things could be done better. Make employees feel as if they're partners rather than workers. We work side by side rather than being a subordinate, if you will, even though there is obviously power hierarchies. Handle conflicts in an open, fair, and professional manner. Provide continuous opportunities for improvement. Um, encourage opportunities for creative problem solving. Um, recognize employees when work is done exceptionally well, or even when it's done repeatedly and often for a long period of time in a very, very highly, um, highly exceptional manner. Make employees, uh, allow employees to make mistakes and learn from them rather than just be chastised or them being afraid to, to bring bad news or whatever. Make sure there's an environment where things can move forward in a, in, in a way that people learn and develop and improve their performance by their own, uh, their own individual learning. So there's lots of very good uh, environments. It's kind of state of the art setting up an, a, a work environment that motivates employees. Let's start, talk a little bit about history. From a historical perspective, there's several different uh, periods of how people think about employees uh, to get us where we are today. Um, the birth of the study of human relations is traced back to what are called time and motion studies. Uh, these were conducted uh, at the turn of the 20th century by um, a gentleman named uh, Frederick Taylor and uh, by Frank and Lillian Gilbreth. Their studies analyzed how workers perform specific work tasks in an effort to sort of build or construct a, uh, a machine, if you will, of how people's work can come together to improve employee productivity, kind of a machine metaphor. This is called scientific management. Um, they built this in uh, what's called the classic theory of motivation in this uh, application of the scientific principles of management. Uh, that is that money is the sole motivator. That was what was believed. You just motivate people. That's where peace work comes from, etc. Taylor suggested that workers would pay more if they were paid directly by the amount of work they did. Um, this was supposed to be an idea that would benefit both workers and companies. Companies would get higher productivity. Those employees that worked harder would be paid more. So there's this notion uh, that they would produce more if you paid them more. So that's... Um, kind of like what this uh, classical theory of motivation was. Uh, to improve management productivity then, Taylor thought that managers should break down each job into specific component tasks and determine the best way to perform each one of those tasks, train people to do that, specify the output of each task to be achieved by the worker performing the task. He also believed that incentives would motivate employees to be more productive. Thus, he suggested that the managers link the workers' pay directly to the output. He developed this piece rate system under which employees were paid a certain amount for each unit they produced, and those who exceeded their quota were paid a higher rate per unit for all the units they produced. We still see some of Taylor's ideas in practice in the financial incentives that are used in some organizations to enhance productivity. So there was this notion if you make it, keep it simple, repeated tasks, well-trained, people would just work on one thing. Of course, we could just nowadays just think about that and imagine how difficult and tedious certain jobs could be under those circumstances. Um, 
that was early in the 20th century. You could kind of imagine those kind of shops. Uh, let's follow through on the history a little bit further. A, a very important um, effect occurred in, in what's called the Hawthorne studies. There is a group, Ellen Elton Mayo and his researchers from Harvard studied conditions in the workplace and to try and understand what caused and impacted productivity. Specifically, they were looking at noise levels and lighting conditions in a Western electric plant in Hawthorne, Illinois. Uh, they were dis what they discovered was that regardless of how much or how little light there was, productivity seemed to increase. They concluded that the attention that they were paying to the employees by researching them was actually increasing their productivity. In other words, the fact that people were watching them and interested in what they were doing actually was increasing productivity. Interest, paying attention, giving people uh, their uh, visibility into their own contributions increased productivity. This is known as the Hawthorne effect, and it's the beginning of this modern human relations argument about how intrinsic motivation works. So let's dig a little deeper. In 1924 through 1932, researchers studied a group of workers at this Hawthorne plant um, and measured their productivity given different kinds of physical conditions. Of course, the researchers were in there watching what was going on. What we discovered was puzzle. What they discovered was puzzling. That is, that the productivity seemed to increase regardless of the physical conditions. If you looked at their productivity before the study and then after the study, no matter what they changed, the productivity actually increased. This phenomenon labeled, as we said, the Hawthorne effect. When questioned about the behavior, the employees expressed satisfaction because the co-workers in the experiment, that is, their people that were helping them or researching them, were friendly and they made them feel more important. Their supervisors should ask for their help and cooperation in the study. In other words, they had been asked to participate. In other words, they were responding to the attention they received and the fact that they were a part of a study that was very considered very significant for the organization. It didn't really matter what was changing in the physical environment. The researchers concluded that the social and psychological factors that are at work within an, a work group associated with people's sense of self-efficacy which means they feel like they are participating in something that they can contribute to, um, help their productivity and their morale. Based upon these experiments, the human relations uh, field in the workplace began to, be, to blossom as people began to understand that you had to treat people like people. And if you did, they would be more, work harder and be more motivated. They revealed that human factors, in fact, do influence workers' behavior and that it's not a scientific management process of breaking it down into pieces and paying them more, but it's more that the managers had to understand the beliefs, the needs, the expectations of the people that were working and that they would have the greatest success in motivating their workers if they worked with them as people rather than as machines, if you will. It's almost too obvious in our current uh, state of the way we understand how work works, but that it was a breakthrough at the time. Some companies let people bring in their pets to work or add incentives to make the workplace seem more friendly. Uh, we see that in the, the, the Silicon Valley model now with ping pong tables and pool tables and treating people with respect and realizing that giving them people what they want makes them feel like they're part of a family or part of a group that is trying to work together to achieve a, per, a certain kind of objective. So let's talk for a second about some of the a summary of some of the key theories of motivation that have developed uh, as a result of this human relations movement and we'll talk about some of these in more detail in the other lectures. But but first of all is the Ma what's called the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which talks about how motivation comes from having certain types of your physical needs and your safety and security cared for, and then how it moves up and you get motivated by uh, more abstract things later. McGregor's theory in X and Y we'll talk about. Um, uh, this is a couple a summary of them that is 
theory X is that you have to really push people. Theory Y is that you kind of pull them by motivating them intrinsically. And if you let them do their work and they're good at it, they'll be more motivated. We'll talk about each of these a little bit more. Equity theory, treating people fair. Expectancy theory, people have to expect that what they do actually has an impact. Those kinds of things. So we'll talk about each of those in the lectures to come in this module.